Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really grateful to the organizers for giving me the chance to present about this system that we've been developing over a number of years. And it's great to see so many uh, friends and colleagues here. Um, so um, because the talk is short and uh, there's a lot I could tell you about uh, the system, uh, it's um, important for me to point out that we have a poster uh, in the session this afternoon at lunchtime. And uh, two of the group members, uh, so Guillaume is, uh, who's sitting right there, is presenting this poster. And also uh, Sonia Rojic, from my, uh, from, who's part of my lab, is back there. Hi, Sonia. Um, and she uh, helps lead the curation efforts. Uh, so feel free to approach them and ask some questions, or, or of course, myself. So the motivation for the, the project I'm going to talk about is uh, that you know data reuse. I don't think I need to sell that idea to this crowd um, of all, uh, but um, just in terms of things that are powered by, uh, that can be powered by uh, the system, uh, are things like contextualizing new re new results. And so this is a paper that was powered by Gemma uh, from on the left hand side. Uh, we did a few years ago with uh, Jesse Gillis's group. And uh, looking for uh, genes that are differentially expressed in a very sort of generic way, they uh, uh, they show up, tend to show up very commonly in studies, and that's something that we were able to uncover by anal analyzing hundreds of data sets from the Gemma system. And so the idea is that knowing which genes tend to be sort of generic and come up and you know, are likely to come up in any given study, that maybe you can help draw your attention to other genes that might be a little bit more uh, unique. Um, and another big application would be meta-analysis. So this is an example from a paper we published last year uh, uh, from uh, my PhD student, Alex Warren, who also had a poster yesterday on so something a little bit different. But uh, so where we reanalyzed hundreds of transition factor perturbation data sets uh, to look for, or, uh, you know, to do a meta-analysis and find genes which were repeatedly perturbed by uh, transition factor perturbations. And uh, again, this was powered by Gemma. So I'm not going to talk more about those applications because I just want to tell you about um, the system. And um, so uh, what we are building on is uh, open data sources that already exist. And so the main one is the gene expression on the bus. And I think hopefully many people here are at least glancingly familiar with it. And it's again, we, we are getting most of our data from GEO uh, and it's it's. Great, but if, if people have actually tried to reuse data from GEO, you often have to do a lot of work yourself to make it ready to use. And I'm not gonna go through this list of uh, you know, potential things that you might run into when using GEO or data from GEO, but things like uh, the, one of the big ones is that the annotations are not standardized. Uh, think all the data processes are not standardized. There's no additional quality control that's done. Uh, they rely on the data submitters to do that and lots of other complications and corner cases. So the goal for Gemma is to ease the path to data reuse. And this is just a shot of the homepage. Uh, the software itself is all uh, available under uh, liberal open source license, as well as the data. And um, we also had a paper a few years ago when the, when the system was half the size it is now, uh, which gives a lot more detail about the curation and uh, data analysis workflows as they existed a few years ago. Things have changed a little bit. So I refer you to that if you want to get more details. Um, so. Uh, I want to move then to talking about what's actually in the system that we've developed uh, before I, I tell you a bit more what, about what you can do and also how we built it. So uh, we've decided to focus on three mammalian species. We used to support a few more species, but we were sort of stretched for resources, so we drew back on that. Um, when I submitted the abstract to the, uh, to the conference, we had over 18,000 data sets, but since then we crossed the 19,000 barrier, and we're going to um, pretty soon cross 20,000. Uh, so this is um, a mixture of RNA-seq and microarray data sets. Uh, we've been doing this uh, for not as, quite as long as BOSC has been around, but uh, kind, of, kind of close. Uh, we'll have sort of our 20th anniversary next year. Uh, and uh, for these species, uh, we have about, we, uh, last time I crunched the numbers, about a third of the data sets that are in GEO. So it's certainly not everything in GEO, uh, but about 40% of the samples, and you can see the breakdown there uh, for how it goes by species. So just a little bit more about how we, why we don't have all the data sets, you know, what we're actually looking at. So again, I mentioned that we're focusing on three mammalian taxa. Uh, and then that we've really um, ended up having a very, very broad and all, but also deep collection of data. 
so thousands and thousands of different experimental conditions. Uh, you just, you know, just imagine taking not quite random, but um, data sets from GEL and what you would get. Uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, I'm showing uh, just a little peek through the keyhole um, of our uh, new data uh, data browser, uh, just li listing, you know, just the top some a few examples of the kind of conditions we have. So, of course, again, there's thousands of these that you can access. Uh, because of the interest of my lab and our, our funding sources, uh, we have prioritized certain types of studies. So we have especially good coverage of the nervous system. Um, but we've also, uh, over the last few years, especially focused on making sure we have small molecule, uh, so drug-like treatment data sets. And also, I, I mentioned transition factor perturbation. So we've continued to collect those, and there's still more of those in the work. In the work. So in terms of things that we don't handle, um, so very, a very common problem, microarrays uh, data sets, which I know very few people would do microarrays now, but a, a huge amount of the historical data, and also when we started, that was all there was. But very commonly, microarray platforms lack actual information about what the probe sequences were. So actually confirming or you know getting a confident sense of what genes are being assayed is, is difficult. Um, studies that lack experimental design, so there may be just a population sample, are a little bit less suitable for us. There's also data sets that are very small and things like technology evaluations. So, so again, like there's some sort of swath of the data that is, I would say, not of interest or eligible for us. Um, uh, so that's one, one explanation for, you know, the data sets we have tend to be a little bit larger and um, I'd say higher quality or higher coverage. Uh, so single cell data is currently a gap and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and I'm really interested in getting people's feedback about our plans to do that. And um, I always tell people that if there's, you know, looking for a certain type of data that we don't have, uh, you know, please let us know. Uh, we have done curation of data sets for people like, oh, I need this you know, data sets on this particular cell type or something. Can you help with that? We have done that in the past. So the, um, the curation process, uh, you know, I, I could give a whole, like an hour long talk about this. It's uh, quite complicated. And you know, there's tons and tons of, uh, you know, different kinds of issues you run into. So this is just a very high level overview. Uh, and it's at the same figures on the poster. Uh, on the right hand side are just some screenshots, which are probably too small to read, but just giving an, a sense of some of our uh, curation interfaces and then the final output. So we have a pipeline that does as much of this as possible automatically. So downloading the data, entering it into our database based on uh, GEO soft files. We reprocess from raw data for um, as many data sets as we can. So for Affymetrix, microarrays, and RNA-seq from raw data. Uh, then we have a bunch of uh, um, diagnostics and quality control measures that we produce. And so that's what's shown in the upper right, some of the kinds of things we, we do. And the curators will review that and use that to do things like identify outlier samples, which is very common. So these are data sets that are in GEO, many of them published that have really glaring outliers. Uh, so we, we remove those. And also batch correction is something we address, and I'll talk about that in a couple slides. Um, and uh, yeah, then we do annotation, um, and, and uh, so uh, I'll talk about that next. And then finally, differential expression. So I have a slide on, on each of those really, uh, some, some of those steps uh, I'll try to get through. So uh, first of all, we, um, another, another great resource that we benefit from besides GEO is the bioontologies effort that the, that the community has um, uh, built up over the years. So we, we rely on those ontologies for doing our data annotation. Um, last time I did a count, we have over 15,000 different ontology concepts that we uh, actually use. There's still a fair amount of free text descriptions, which we do try to harmonize. Uh, you know, there's gaps in ontologies, and we do submit terms to ontologies for inclusion. That's a very slow process. We have a, we have a very small ontology of our own for some specialized concepts, but um, we're trying not to become ontology developers. Uh, one thing I, uh, I'll just sort of gloss over, but just briefly that we used to, our annotations of individual samples in the system used to be more of a bag of ontology concepts. So uh, starting last year, we started, we migrated to a more RDF-like statement framework. Uh, and uh, that, that's, this is the, the curation interface on the right-hand side. So that this lets us um, do things like just very simply describe like a drug and the dosage or the, the drug and the duration. So this has been like a real benefit to making the annotations easier to use uh, back the other at the other end. Uh, I just want to mention again briefly that our search uses basic ontology inference to expand queries. So if you search for brain, you'll get a lot of data sets, but you'll get data sets that in 
don't mention brains explicitly, but they involve the cerebellum or some part of the brain. So, uh, and that's true for all the ontologies that, that we use. Yeah, so the, the process of adding these terms to, the, uh, to each sample, and also we add some terms to the data set, that's done by curators. So we train undergraduate co-op students primarily to do that. Um, it's been a really uh, great uh, experience having it, doing it that way. Uh, and so the tools really make it very fast and support them choosing ontology terms that are already used and making sure things are harmonized. And we have a very uh, lengthy uh, wiki in-house of our curation guidelines. So next I'll just briefly mention kind of a complexity that um, we think is uniquely uh, addressed by Gemma. So is batch information. So it, you know, addressing technical factors that uh, might obscure biological signals is a real, you know, kind of in all types of data collection, uh, you have to be concerned about, and this is especially true for transcriptomes, and, but this is almost never recorded. And when I say almost never, like a, I can think of like a handful of cases we've seen where the batch information is actually included by the data submitter in the GEO record. So uh, maybe that's gonna change in the future, I hope so, but, um, we, so we try to infer that from things like date stamps or device information in fast queue headers, uh, but a lot of platforms, we don't have that. And then we use some heuristics to try to group the samples into what we think are reasonable batches. So whether that truly reflects what were the technical batches that were done by the, uh, the data, the, by the authors, we don't necessarily know, uh, but we'll use some additional heuristics to decide whether those batches are actually correlated with any strong um, you know, expression signal in the data. We use principal components analysis to assist with that. So at the end of the day, um, if data sets uh, end up um, uh, needing it, we perform batch correction. So the pie charts on the bottom just show that for most data sets, 60%, uh, we do have some kind of indication of what the batches might be from those files, but there's still 40% or so that do not. Of those, um, you can see there's a large swath that we decide they're just they were done in a single batch or the batch effects are really small so we don't need to do any correction because batch correction is actually kind of a nasty thing to do to data um, very commonly the batches are confounded with the experimental design this is like you know i forgot to put the numbers here but you know what is that a third uh, of the of the ones where you have the batch information so then we can't do batch correction so that's just in there um you know again like a lot of times when we actually do evaluate batches they aren't it isn't that serious so we're hoping that you know especially if you analyze lots of data sets, that'll come out in the wash. And then there's only about 10% of those, 5% of the overall data or so, where we actually end up performing batch correction. Uh, so then, um, so once we've had this data, it's, it's like cleaned, it's assembled and reprocessed, it's annotated, uh, and that we've, the last thing we do is a differential expression analysis using the experimental design that we set up. So for this, we have an in-house implementation of the Lima Voom algorithm, which is a very standard method for doing differential expression analysis. Uh, we use, uh, so we're not just doing t-tests, we're doing multivariate linear models. So we include continuous covariates in the, in the model when that's, a, you know, if that's part of the experimental design. Uh, so this is something that's, uh, you know, again, above what I think is available through other resources. And then we store those results at the individual contrast level. So, you know, the comparisons of the conditions. And the software supports being able to retrieve this in different ways. And at the right, I have a plot, which is not a very interesting plot in terms of what it's showing, but it's just a bit of a flex of the system where we can, you know, with, with our R package that we did this, we can do the same thing in the Python package or just with the API to pull out the differential expression results for one gene across like as many studies as you want. And, uh, and then you can you know, make plots of that data. So this is a, like a volcano plot kind of thing, but it's not a regular volcano plot where each point would be a gene. All the points here are for the same gene. They're all coming from different compar condition comparisons. And that's again, something you can generate in just a, a few lines of code in a few seconds. Uh, so um, finally, I'll just, uh, we have a whole poster about accessing the data, but I just wanna make sure I highlight this again. Uh, for people who want to use this, that we have this new browser that we developed that is, um, you know, sort of inspired by lots of sort of shopping cart kind of paradigms. We don't have an explicit shopping cart, but um, uh, so you can, 
easily search the data very easily and browse the kind of categories that we've put the data sets into the, based on the annotations. And so you can uh, eas easily navigate and find data sets that you want. And then that interface actually will generate a little snippet of code for you that you can use in your language of preference to retrieve the data and then go on to doing more analysis that way. Or you can click on a link and go and find a particular data set and download it just through the web interface. So again, uh, see the poster for more information about that. And uh, so the last thing I'll, I'll talk about before summing up is our efforts to introduce single cell data into the system. So this is something that uh, we've been thinking about for a, quite a while and trying, you know, planning for, and it's really an under active development right now. Uh, thanks. Um, so uh, we're, we're, I, I do want, I really would love to hear people's feedback or input about how we, you know, they think we should do this. Uh, so we want to make this basically fit into Gemma's framework where we would have uh, studies that have biological replicates and some kind of experimental design. Uh, we're going to be using pseudo-bulking at the cell type and subject or sample level uh, for our analysis so that it basically ends up being kind of like a regular expression data set. We're not trying to, we definitely don't want to duplicate efforts of other uh, single cell repositories like cell by gene. In fact, we want to, we want to benefit from those. Uh, but the biggest bottleneck we have is cell type annotation and being able to do that in a sufficiently scalable way. So if you know anything about single cell data, you know that like that's often a very big task is trying to figure out what the cell types are. And there's lots and lots of methods out there for doing this automatically. So we probably have to make some compromises in how we do that to make it um, scalable, but hopefully also useful. And that's something, again, I'd like to hear people's feedback about. Uh, so to sum up, um, I think Gemma is a really a unique resource. I'm not aware of anything of its scale and scope. Uh, it hides a lot of the complexity of GEO. We don't have all the data, so that's one downside, but we can add data. Uh, we, we add a lot of values to the data and it's still under active development. Um, and so in terms of how you can get involved, like please use it. Uh, you can integrate the software into your own tools uh, and analyses, and uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. So I'll just uh, finish by again, um, thanking my lab. Um, so I just won't read the names off there, but um, again, some people are here at the conference and I want to acknowledge our funding sources, especially NIH, which has supported this project since its, its inception and um, be glad to take questions. Okay. Thank you. A any questions from the audience? Please. Thanks for a great resource. I have two questions that will be quick. One perhaps, do you include genotypes? Do you include mice genotypes in the metadata information? Oh, and second yeah. one, if it's okay, I'm a heavy user of recount. Why should I switch to Gemma instead of recount? I would like to hear a bit of oh, recount. Um, so I, so I'll, I'll answer that. Just, um, so, well, actually, so about, about mouse genotypes, you mean like mouse strains and things yeah. like that? Yes, we do. Uh, so, uh, of, of course. And uh, so for recount, um, uh, again, that's only RNA-seq data. So we have like a lot of our data is microarrays. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know that much about recount, so I, I actually should probably know more about it. But I wasn't aware that they do this kind of quality control and also the differential expression analysis and annotation at, at the level that we do. So I think um, you know NIH is also uh, GEO is also reanalyzing RNA seq data sets, and so that's something that you know is currently in kind of a gap in GEO. So I, I would I would give those those reasons that that's still something that we're not doesn't seem to be available elsewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Oh hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> thank you for that great talk. I I would like to introduce myself. Um, I am Emily Clough, and I am the team lead for GEO. Oh hi. Hi. <laughs> So, so it is it is fantastic to see this work, and I would love to speak with you more about use of geo. Um, in terms of the batch information, do you have an ideal place you would like to find this in geo records? <laughs> Any, anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I mean, it'd be really great to have that as one of the sample attributes, uh, like, you know, just give the a number batch one or I don't, it doesn't matter what it is that, that'd be where I would maybe natural fit and as long as uh, it's standardized to some degree we would be able to use it that'd be really great like there's so many platforms where we just can't infer batches for various reasons 
Uh, and so even, you know, and of course, like we'd much rather have the, the, the data submitter tell us what they think the batches are um, because we're kind of making it up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'll talk to you later. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we have a great relationship with GEO. We communicate with the team a lot. So Tanya Barrett, we, we had a lot, a lot of, who's, I guess, before. So thank you. Okay. Um.